How's it going, everyone? Welcome to episode 38 of Greels Reels. I'm your host, Robert Greeley, and I hope you all are having a great day. This is a special episode today. You know, I feel like I say that a lot, but today, Brendan Galanders gives us so much insight into the world of being a professional football player. From an almost career ending injury during the combine, winning the Grey Cup for his hometown of Ottawa, a deep dive into some of the greatest to ever play in the CFL that Brendan has actually played with himself playing at the University of Ottawa in the era of coaching changes and the return of the Panda game, looking at life after football, and so much more. Really hope everyone enjoys today's episode, and if you do, let us know with a review or even share this with someone who else you think would like it. All right, let's get into today's show. Welcome back to Greels Reels, everyone, the podcast where I get to chat with athletes that I've gotten to know through working in the world of sports. And today's guest is a, I mean, an Ottawa staple. He's he's played everywhere in Ottawa from the uh, the Pee Wee leagues right to the pros. Brendan Glanders, how's it going? Good. How are you, Rob? Yeah, I'm good. It's uh, nice to finally sit down and chat with you. Um, yeah, I mean. In terms of a career, it very much uh, is a staple location for you, eh? Ottawa, your hometown, like how how's that been? Yeah, no, it's it's been uh, so much fun. Like you said, I, I started playing football here right from the youngest uh, age group of the local community association um, and CAFA for the Cumberland Panthers. Went all the way up through that organization, played high school football here in Orleans for uh, Sir Wilfrid Laurier, uh, played university football here at the University of Ottawa five years. Um, Went and spent two years in Toronto playing for the Argonauts, but then obviously came back and have been here since uh, 2016 with the Ottawa Red Blacks. So, I mean, it's it's uh, special. I'm definitely uh, involved in the Ottawa community and the Ottawa football community. So it's it's special to be able to stay here year round and contribute that way. Mm hmm. And yeah, so we'll we'll kind of start from, you know, those high school peewee days like Sir Wilfred Laurier. I mean. I know uh, since your career's gone on, they've really uh, you know embraced you as a, as an alum and, and things of that nature. But when you were uh, when you were playing, like what was it like? Like did you kind of were you like yeah you know what, I'm gonna make this a career? <laughs> no, no, no. In in high school, it's just about having fun. Um, I mean, it was the first time. Like when you play community football, uh, you're with the guys like three, four times a week. Play on Saturdays and stuff like that, and it's it's fun. But I mean, high school football is really the first introduction to um, you're around the team twenty four seven. You have that football team identity. Walking around the school, you're wearing your uh, jerseys on game days at the school, um, and it was something special, right? It's it's playing with friends that I grew up with. Um, the locker rooms right there in the school and uh you know i i honestly credit the the coaches um who had just happened to be gym teachers at sir will at the time eric conan and richard varden um for you know keeping keeping football fun um i mean it was it was probably uh, one of the best experiences of my life it was it was fun um we had just happened to have a good team and uh the atmosphere that they kept it was it was high performing football but i mean at the end of the day it was fun and i guarantee you every single person on that team um loved going to school every single day because we got to play football so that's important right um i mean we're student athletes so when you love going to school whether it's for school purposes or football purposes you had to do well in school if you wanted to play football so i mean uh, it gave us something to look forward to yeah and i mean i like i've also i've chatted with a few guys uh from that auto area and went to that same high school and it's like yeah, they very much look at you as like that kind of like role model of like, hey, yeah, I go, I go to, I go to Laurier like, playing in the pros like that's a possibility for me. So even like now, kind of sitting back and like looking at that, how's that feel? <laughs> it's uh, it's cool. Yeah, I mean, it just from Sir Will alone. I mean, we've got. Uh, I I just happen to be the oldest, but by no means would I say I, I was the best athlete to come out of there. I mean, um, we've got Jackson Bennett, who uh, obviously is in the CFL right now. Uh, Curly Gittens as well. Um, I mean, if if I'm dating myself here and making me sound old, but I mean, I helped coach those guys coming up and now I'm playing against them right so I mean but but they're phenomenal athletes I I'm not going to take any credit whatsoever for their success they would have made it regardless of who their coaches were there mm-hmm. they're just that good of athletes and that dedicated to their craft um but you know it's it's something that uh I'm I'm honored if I can take on any sort of mentorship role um I'll embrace it because when I was young I, I had extremely high level coaches and good people in my life and to kind of steer me in the right direction so if I can do that to 
to one, two, or three people, then, I mean, it, as far as I'm concerned, it's just passing it on. That's I'm not doing anything special. I'm just giving back the same uh, opportunities that I was afforded when I was young. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And uh, so with that uh, with that in mind, so, you know, whenever you're playing Hamilton and Jackson, uh, you know, in those warm-ups, are you just like, hey, man, remember, like, Take it easy on me a little bit today on specials or anything like that, or is it all uh, full force? Oh no, it's full force for sure. You can't, you can't turn it on. I mean, that's that's what makes professional athletes special, right? Is is our competitive nature? And I mean, Jackson's a competitor. Uh, Curly's a competitor. I mean, I I'm a competitor. Um, but but we have fun for sure before and after the games, even even training. You know, um, I mean, I've been around Jackson training uh, when he was at the University of Ottawa, and uh, obviously we've we've been in the same gyms here in Ottawa. For for the last few years so even training gets it gets a little competitive sometimes man but uh that's that's what makes it special mm -hmm. no 100 percent. i guess that's a kind of good segue into like your recruitment process so when that started like getting the ball rolling because ultimately you committed to uh, the university of ottawa what uh like what really was that process looking like for you like how'd you go through those motions um, so the majority of uh, recruiting that I had done was through two avenues, basically. Um, I was on the U-17 uh, Team Eastern Ontario in the Canada Cup um, way back in the day and uh, ended up winning tournament offensive MVP. Um, we uh, ended up uh, doing pretty well, um, and pretty much all the coaches from uh, that tournament are U sports level coaches, right? So um, my offensive coordinator just happened to be Chris Colson, who was the offensive coordinator at the University of Ottawa. Um, and, uh, it, you know, I, I kind of had a connection with him right off the bat. So U Ottawa was on my radar right off the bat from that, let alone um, obviously playing high school here. I had constant conversation with Coach Piche and uh, Coach Colson right off the bat as well. And then obviously um, from there came a bunch of other schools that were interested. I was getting letters in the mail, um, went on recruiting visits to Queens, McMaster, uh, had a couple of NCAA opportunities as well. And uh, same thing playing in the OVFL um, for the Cumberland Panthers, which is a summer league, which is kind of counter counterintuitive, but the NCAFA and fall leagues kind of get watered down because half the Ottawa talent is playing high school football and half the Ottawa talent is playing NCAFA, depending on the level of your high school team, right? Mm -hmm. So um, in Ottawa, the best football happens in uh, the spring and summer right in in the provincial leagues um so i also got recruited heavily through there as well um but in the end in all honesty and it, it's a warning to all players in high school and i tell everybody that i have the opportunity to um in grade 11 i well i was an honor roll student all the way through high school until i got to grade 12 when i was in grade 11 i played on the the senior varsity football team from grade 10 to 12 right so all of my friends were always a grade above me um so when i got to grade 12 basically Almost all of my friends graduated, um, were playing CIS football or U sports football, I guess now. And, uh, you know, I, I slacked off. I had the big man on campus syndrome, as I call it. And um, school became a second priority to football. And unfortunately, in Canada, you need marks to get into university. It doesn't matter how good of a football player you are. And I didn't leave myself very many options. I wanted to get into human kinetics or kinesiology um, programs. And you need good marks to get into those schools. I mean, the cut off my graduation year was an 86 average and I was nowhere close to that um, I, I distinctly remember coach Piche at the University of Ottawa sending a email to uh, the head of the faculty of human kinetics at the University of Ottawa and kind of cc'd me on the email um, more or less asking like what can this player do to try and get into human kinetics that year and I really appreciated him reaching out but I mean the the head of the faculty more or less said like He's 10% under the cutoff, like, I'm sorry, I can't do anything, and you know what I mean? And that's, that it is what it is. I kind of pigeoned to hold myself, and um, I didn't get into the program that I wanted to get into anywhere, so, I mean, I, I, one, I wasn't willing to move away from home to take a social science or psychology degree, and no offense to those degrees whatsoever, it's just not what I wanted to do, right? Mm -hmm. So I wasn't about to move away from home and start a degree that I didn't want to do. Um, so that was one factor, and then the other factor, obviously, 
obviously, was the quality of the University of Ottawa football team at the time. I mean, we were a top three school in the country at the time, um, trending up, and I did have familiarity with the coaching staff as well, right? So then it became an easy decision. I didn't get in anywhere else. Plus, if I stay at home, I've got a great opportunity right in front of me. So um, that's what ended up happening, and I ended up just going into a general social science degree my first year and uh, ended up having a high enough grade point average to switch over into human kinetics after my first year and all of those first year classes essentially became my electives so I just had to take compulsory credits the entire rest of the way Um, so I mean I did it the hard way (laughs) and and it ended up working out but I mean it's it's like I said a cautionary tale to all high school athletes that um, your student athletes student is the first word athletes the second word right you the last thing you want to do is take away opportunities yourself uh, from yourself because you don't take care of your work in the classroom. Your work in the classroom is what is important. I've I've been lucky. I've had a seven year professional football career up to this point, but you know I'm I'm in the minority. Um, so I mean, and and even then, um, I'm still constantly uh, looking for opportunities outside of football for after I retire. So. Football's not going to last forever, and and unfortunately, after your football career is done, um, I mean, you you have to have something to fall back on. And luckily, I have that human kinetics degree to fall back on. And uh, like I said, I, I definitely want to make high school athletes aware of the fact that you need to take care of your grades if you want to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. No, it's that's such a huge point. I like. Obviously not on the athlete standpoint, but I was in a similar boat. Like, the institution that I wanted to go to right out of high school, like, they liked all the extra stuff that I was doing in the field. But they So they put me on the wait list, but they're like, your your grades are ridiculous. Like, what do you mean kind of thing, right? So, like, I never got off that wait list. And then, yeah, I, I luckily enough found a program in my hometown that was just a year program at a college that essentially gave me something else to put on my transcript. And then eventually... Uh, I still actually didn't even get into that institution, which was Ryerson, which is funny enough where I'm doing my master's now. But, uh, it, I, you know, you keep keep knocking and they'll, they'll eventually let you in. But, yeah, um, yeah no, I, like I was, I was struggling to find like an institution, right, like after that. And so I had to, you know, spend a whole year out of college. And like academically, like that was the hardest year that I've ever worked. And it, it showed up and, you know, I got uh, got accepted into like the most universities that like, because the previous year was basically nothing like it was a couple colleges that accepted me but then um yeah the next year I, I got accepted into a bunch of universities that I was looking at I knew more options too and then uh, yeah so for me like U Ottawa made sense as well right where it was mm-hmm. just like it's the best opportunity and they gave me like three credits I didn't have to take like essentials <laughs> to essay writing so they were like I was like you know what sure I'll, I'll take that trade off right but yeah it, and that's the thing right so it's like that whole like standpoint of a year and I like I lucked out like coming across that program right like if I didn't come across that program like who knows essentially where I would be at or what I'd be doing right now because it's like I didn't value academics as much as I should have in that last high school year right and it bites you in the butt yeah no it does exactly exactly you you need something to fall back on and the thing that I tell all all student athletes and and people in general is that if if you're passionate about something you need to put the same passion into into school because unfortunately if you don't have that I mean even a university degree let alone a high school graduation right now even a university degree doesn't get you anything in the real world anymore you need practical experience and um, you need to show basically em- employers what you can do and what you bring to the table um, so I mean the the people that take care of the school and do the extra stuff the community service the community work helping others and have that stuff on their resume in addition to being a student athlete are the people that are going to succeed after they're done their sport for sure yeah there's, there's so many faucets to it now and it's just like you said it's nothing guaranteed and like we live in a world too where it's like yeah, you know what, you could not do anything and start an e-commerce business <laughs> from home and next thing you know, you're, you're making millions. But uh, a lot of the times too, it's just like, uh, I find for me anyway, institutions, they give you that, at least the opportunity to like network and, and build on, on what you're doing, right? So I mean, like if I just spent four years studying at U Ottawa, like I, I still would have a very different life, right? It's, uh, you know, we're sitting down right now because I got involved with the football team, which you ended up having to be an alumni of, right? And then, mm-hmm. you know, everything kind of spirals and, uh, you know, through the seasons of working there and then the community of football and guys going off to the CFL, then, like, 
you know, obviously I still know those guys. So, you know, you chat with them and then you bump into the people who work with the Red Blacks and, uh, you know, Tiger Cats or 67s, whatever it may be. And then, you know, you chat with them and stuff like that. And then they know your name and you get to do more opportunities because of just how you are involved and not necessarily just the classroom component. Right. So it's. Yeah, realistically, like there's so many different a- a- aspects of it all that you need to apply yourself to. Yeah, no, absolutely, 100%. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, that's just it. I've, it. Unfortunately, like you said, we live in a world where, um, I mean, social media can make people famous and and unfortunately everybody else in the world has a university or college degree anyway so so you need something to separate yourself right and building that work ethic right from school whether it's through sport or or academics um you definitely need something to set yourself apart for sure yeah no it's uh and it's even interesting too just how all all that works right because yeah like it it's one of those things where it's like you know you're even seeing uh you know those people on social media who are famous like i mean there's there's youtube channels that, that pull in great views because they they have a, like a phd like they're doctors like they're like showing insight into like that world of things right so the the limit limits are there there is no limits basically like, yeah they're, they're non-existent <laughs> Uh, so let's talk about the play at uh, U Ottawa, you know, because you you had a very successful career at uh, the running back position. I mean, I guess strategically, how do you kind of approach you know game playing going into uh, week by week? Um, I mean, uh, first off, I'll, I'll start with the story, like my rookie year. Um, when I was in my first year at the University of Ottawa, they didn't have any age eligibility rules. So like I walked in at 18 years old and we had guys that were over 30 years old on our team. We, we had running backs that were 28, 27, 26. Um, so I mean, I, I walked into a pretty intimidating situation, right? Nowadays, if you're 18 walking in, the oldest someone's going to be is 24 years old, right? Um, and I started out day one of uh, training camp. I remember it. I was number 12 on the running back depth chart. Number 12. I was like, how the hell do they even have 12 running backs? Like, it was crazy, right? And um, it's funny, actually. I kind of distinctly remember it. It's funny what you remember, like little moments in life that you kind of uh, store in your brain as defining moments. And it can be little things, right? Like, I remember it's probably the third or fourth day in training camp, and uh, we were doing inside run. Um, basically like a version of Oklahoma drill, right? Like half line, uh, one lead blocker, two offensive linemen, two D linemen, two linebackers, and just banging (laughs) old, old school football drills in training camp. And, uh, I was running and, uh, we weren't tackling to the ground though. And, uh, I got through the line of scrimmage and just didn't get my feet up and tripped or whatever. And I distinctly remember coach Piche coming over and kind of saying, um, you're better than this. We didn't bring you in for you to look like this. And you know, that, that kind of challenge and, um, kind of set me off in the way you know what I mean he I, I mean Denny Pichet was was a great coach and knew what to say to get the most out of players and uh I think that that was kind of the defining moment of my rookie year um I mean after that I went on to have a great camp uh I went on to basically back up a another first year running back who just came out of uh Juco in the states um and we split backfield carries like I started two games in my in my rookie season for the University of Ottawa, and uh, it went extremely well. It went extremely well. Um, I mean, obviously, the level of play was was kind of crazy, and like I said, the the thing that's going to keep you off your field, off the field in your rookie season of any sport, no matter what it is, is it's going to be the learning curve, right? If, if you don't understand and know the playbook, like the back of your own hand, you're not going to get on the field, um, because if you're thinking, you're not moving fast. And when you move fast and you're in this flow state, that's when the good things happen. So there was definitely a little bit of a learning curve. Um, but, I mean, I, I had amazing mentors on the team. and They kind of embraced me. I, I remember one of the offensive linemen before my first start. Um, we were in the huddle on the day before a game. And <laughs> he kind of came over uh, to me at the time. And uh, it was one of the older guys on the team. Like I said, one of those 27, 28-year-olds. Um he was like, hey, listen, we, we've got a good thing going on here. 
so try not to screw it up. <laughs> and at the time, I was like, is this guy serious? Like, it's a day before my first start, but you know what? It's it's accountability, and it, I mean, they know that it's bigger than any one person, right? And that's an important lesson to learn when you're young. It's not about me making my first start. It's about the team getting the win. And uh, so, I mean, I, I was fortunate young in my U Auto career to have that sort of uh, mentorship by some of the older players. Um and then move, moving through the years, I was I was in a difficult situation at the University of Ottawa. I was probably, I mean, my group, the guys that were there from like 2008, I went in there from 2009 to 2014, but the guys that were same thing from 2008 to 2013, I mean, I played for four different head coaches in five years. So it's, it's tough to get any kind of continuity, um, the playbook changes and uh, things like that. So... Um, it was it was a little bit of a different experience, but you know the the reason why we made it work and the reason why we had some phenomenal players that had CFL opportunities is because of the leadership group and and guys that I came in with and you know um, hats off to the coaches that did that recruiting in the 2009 2010 and and all of that because I mean we had good people like mm-hmm. good people first and foremost on the football team that that could turn into leaders so regardless of the changes in the coaching staff um and all that i mean it it was just continuous and we we kept it going um obviously in 2010 uh with brad snopley leading us we made it to the eights cup um unfortunately lost on the last second field goal to western but uh, I mean, I was only part of one losing season. I only missed the playoffs once in in the five years that I played there. So overall, I, it was it was I mean an extremely positive experience. Like I said, it, it was a little bit of a of an unfortunate situation a, a couple of years. Um, but at no point in time would I ever give it up to play for anywhere else. You know what I mean? Because because of what the experience gave me in terms of uh, life skills and leadership ability and just the people. People that I met mm-hmm. no and I mean you're hitting uh, hitting the nail on the head too in the sense of you know I've been able to meet a couple guys from like that era of things and like you know you mentioned Brad mm-hmm. Brad included in that and like uh, it's good people right so it definitely mm-hmm. makes sense that you guys were able to maintain and um, be consistent in terms of success and, and putting wins up uh, over that time span because it's just like it makes sense with like that group of athletes that was just there right and I actually I want to talk about Brad because I mean that uh, like you know the best quarterback in the country at the time like and I mean obviously now he's one of the best receivers <laughs> over the last um, like five I'm trying to think now uh, how basically since he's entered the league he's pretty been, much man <laughs> he's been the uh, you know the best receiver so it's like uh, yeah when you were playing with him in in uh, university like. I mean, what was that like? And now just kind of, you know, full circle being with him all the time now for the last, uh, last few years man it was it was fun to watch him on on the field it was fun to play with him I mean he's he's a special athlete like people don't understand how good of an athlete he is um he was he was a offset track runner in high school apparently he was better at lacrosse than he was at football um he's the best golfer I've ever played with like it's it's phenomenal how good of an athlete he is like you said to make the transition from um uh, at Crichton winning quarterback to to uh, basically one of the best Canadian receivers one of the best receivers forget about the yeah. fact that he's Canadian one of the best receivers in the CFL it's it's so impressive but it's just how good of an athlete he is like it's it's funny I joke with him all the time because in in university there's a couple of things that uh, stood out about playing with him one is I would never ever play catch with him um, prior to games because my hands would be like literally red like he didn't know how to throw the ball softly (laughs) like he has one of the strongest (laughs) arms I've ever seen in my entire life um so I couldn't throw the ball with him before the game because my hands would be freaking hurting come kickoff time like that's how hard he throws the ball and then two is that I knew like I had kind of that had to develop that like quarterback clock in my head where it's like okay if I'm on my check down and I see that he hasn't gotten rid of the ball yet I'm just gonna go and block someone because I mean one 
he didn't throw a check down <laughs> the entire time I, I played at U Ottawa, and I give him crap about that all the time uh, to this day, too. But uh, two, with with the running ability like he has, I don't blame him. <laughs> like, like I said, it was like one Mississippi, two Mississippi. All right, let's go block a linebacker or something because Brad's about to take off. And uh, there's a couple of highlight runs that he had that, I mean, literally on the field, like from the opposite side of the field, if he took off, and I'm just watching him in awe in what, in what he could do. Like, he's a phenomenal phenomenal athlete um and uh yeah it was it was something special to be able to play with him and like you said not only a good athlete but a good human man like super nice guy um quiet but also probably one of the biggest goofballs you'll ever meet um we room together now too so we get to spend a ton ton of time together now and uh it's yeah it's it's uh always been fun i'm i'm glad that we were able to uh reconnect and we're on the same team now because i sure as hell wouldn't want to play against him yeah no 100 percent. i uh no it, it's such a treat watching like him play like just the the sideline like I'm not uh, I was never a big big football guy like obviously like uh, just Newfoundland there's no football so like I uh, it's kind of funny my first actual like uh, I guess recognition of Brad is um, because he went to Newfoundland with the Great Cup Mm -hmm. uh, because um, I believe Jeff Hunt's from yeah uh, exactly out west and uh, so like that was like I was like oh man like that's awesome and it's kind of funny that that's like my first like memory of like kind of like recognizing like Brad Sinopoli as like a, an athlete and then, you know, getting to know him on the sideline every now and then and saying hello and things of that nature. So I, I've never thanked him for that, but it, cause that was huge for the, for the community of Newfoundland. Mm-hmm. Right. And like, I think it definitely got a few people thinking about football and now like, it's still like, you know, very, uh, uh, very small and it's really hard to, you know, create a sustainable program with like our population. Right. Because it's not even like, you know, players, but it's it, coaching staffs and things like that. So, um, uh, but you're you're seeing now like uh, there's a kid who I think uh, from Newfoundland who just like committed to a uh, to a program to a football program uh, that was like last summer or it's like looking like he is like it, you know so it's definitely a building so it was kind of it was cool to see that like that's kind of like I think in the modern area anyway like my group and like the people who are younger than me that's kind of like where it almost the fixation and notice of football uh, started up again. So, yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. And that, it's so important, like you said. I mean, access to great coaching is, is so important. But, I mean, we're kidding ourselves if we don't think that there's great athletes coming from the East Coast, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's their access to, to resources. And, like you said, coaching is so important, too. And that's, that's what's so important here in Canada. Um, and there's been a lot of talk lately about how we – improve the level of play in football in Canada in Canada to compete with what you're seeing in the states and mm-hmm. I mean I'm I'm probably in in the minority but I, it, from my perspective, I don't think that we grow our Canadian game by allowing our best players to go and play NCAA football. And let me back that up by saying I don't blame anybody for going down to the States and playing NCAA football right now because that's their best option. That's their best avenue to play high-level football and then come back here and play in the CFL. So I do not blame them whatsoever. What I'm trying to say is that the the stakeholders in Canadian football, whether it be the CFL, Football Canada, the individual provinces that regulate the football in their provinces to to high school football to community football they all need to basically unite and figure out how we keep the best players in Canada and grow the game that way you know what I mean Mm -hmm. instead of trying to or wasting resources promoting all of these players and how good they're doing in their NCAA teams and Canadians playing in the NFL and stuff like that we need to figure out how to keep the best talent here in Canada and drive them into our U sports programs and build it that way um, and how that happens, I I don't know. But as as far as I'm concerned, like I said, I, I don't fault any player for going down and playing in the in the NCAA whatsoever. It's high level football. Um, I'm sure that they have great experience. They're playing in front of large crowds. They have access to phenomenal resources. But I mean, my my challenge to to um, football communities and and organizations in Canada basically is is to figure out how we keep our country's best talent in Canada to play mm-hmm. football that way. And that's how we build the game. Once we can start um, getting this this top talent into U sports. Um, that's how we how we build the game and then we can promote U sports to the same level that um, we're promoting how 
Canadian players are doing in the, the NCAA, right? Yeah. And I mean, how that happens, I'm I'm not sure. It's it's resources, it's access to coaching, like we were talking about, and uh, I mean. Yeah, p- part of the blame is is on the individual programs in Canada as well. If if you have uh, top football players from the GTA, I mean, there's there's no reason why U Sports coaches shouldn't be able to get them into into U Sports programs, right? But like I said, in, until we have the resources or the ability to keep these athletes in Canada, it's going to be really hard to grow our game. Yeah. No. Hopefully, essentially, you want to get to a spot where you know every game's a panda game times two times three right? absolutely and, exactly uh what's interesting is like you you got the chance to play in like the uh i guess the return of the the panda game like and the when it, when it was still at lees and i hadn't i guess exploded into back at like td place and like the large crowds again so yeah what i mean what was that like when it finally first like started up again it was fun it was fun yeah. i mean it was it was it was different because there was a level of um it, it's funny because everyone says that oh the rivalry was probably forgotten right like Carlton didn't have a football team forever but in the first game the Carlton coaching staff was like 50% U Ottawa's old coaching staff that I initially came in for right and uh, so there was a little bit of a rivalry there obviously our uh, head coach and offensive coordinator left the University of Ottawa's program to go on and take offensive coordinating jobs at Carlton so there was a rivalry there and um, I'll tell you there there's definitely not one ounce of bad blood in in my mind whatsoever there those coaches are some of my best friends now and we see each other all the time um and we're able to talk shop and stuff like that but at the time I know that there was a few players that felt uh, abandoned so I mean it right away the rivalry was like instant again right like we hate Carlton it's no problem let's go out and kick the crap out of them but uh it was it was fun you know it's it's like you said that atmosphere of playing in front of that many fans and um the animosity and the tension building up before the game um and even the the media here in ottawa does does a great job covering it it's it's fun it's fun and it it gives players the opportunity to um experience what it's like to play in the cfl atmosphere especially now playing at td place right i mean not only that but it's it's a huge 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 recruiting tool and advantage for the two teams here in the city right um i mean very rarely are you going to get a game with that many that many people in attendance anywhere else in canada so i mean it's it's a huge recruiting opportunity for the two schools that are here now and it's it's fun to be a part of it's a professional atmosphere at the game so Mm -hmm. it's it's a really cool experience for the players it's good for the ottawa community and it's good for the football community and u sports in general yeah no it's honestly like this is like i guess the time of the year where essentially uh we'd either you know just kind of be going into it or coming out of like the panda week and stuff like that and it's honestly it's one of the best weeks of uh of the year like you know campus life is uh, is a lot better like everybody's like really excited there's different contests going on they got like large uh, anticipation that just keeps building and, and things of that nature now right so it, it's cool that you i guess you kind of got to see like it you know it come back and uh, and then just continue and you know as like you're still with the red blacks you almost get a a front row seat to to what it is now, right? As oh, I well. get a front row seat. I go, I go on the field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like I'm I'm on the sidelines all the time, hanging exactly. hanging out with the guys and stuff like that. But yeah, no, it, like you said, exactly. It's it's a fun atmosphere, and I'll, I'll tell you from being on the sidelines, the players appreciate it. Like you see the players looking back in the stands, and you know that they're taking the moment in. You know what I mean? And in all honesty, that might be the peak of some player's career. It, it, it might, right? Like very, it's it's rare. With there might be one or two players from each team each year that get a CFL opportunity, but for the vast majority of the players, that's going to be the highlight of their career, playing in the Panda game, and that's something special, and it's important to make it special for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, it's uh, if, you, if you guys are hearing the dog in the background, we're out, we're out on, a, <laughs> on a patio, you know? And we got to do things a little bit differently, but uh, um, no, it, exactly. Like, the uh, it, it is something special. Um I think, uh, like, even for myself, it's like, 
walking around like the the stands and stuff like that and like all the students that like you know and like people are like shouting your name out like looking for a photo and things of that nature it's like you, you legitimately like everybody feels like a celebrity like coaching staffs like trainers like the the players like it, it's such a, a big moment and even you know talking about uh for like you sport and the product like honestly it is the it's the biggest event like it's you know on uh, it's a good thing and a bad thing that the fact that like um you know the national championship if the national championship is in quebec city like and laval is there and then maybe it's like a a western or another like highly like uh tether program like maybe a, a calgary or something of of that nature like those games get like twenty one thousand, twenty thousand people out and like Penn is, uh, you know, tipping the scale at, at 24, right? So it's incredible that, like, for the most part, a regular season matchup brings in more than, uh, in terms of attendance, than the national championship, which is, like, unfathomable for a lot of leagues around the, the world, even. Absolutely. And, and you know what? I mean, it, it gives the university so many opportunities, whether it be um, revenue opportunities, sponsorship opportunities, um, media opportunities, the game's broadcasted, right? It, it's professionally done. It, it gives U Sports a platform to be to be shared across Canada and say, hey, this is this is legit. You know what I mean? Like this is not bad football. And it, it goes to say it, exactly what I was talking to in, in terms of grassroots football here in Canada. I mean, um, the thing that young players need to understand and why I get so frustrated at coaches and um, people in the public that are pushing athletes down to the NCAA as opposed to explaining all their options is because I, I came up through Canadian fo- or amateur football here in, in Ottawa. I came up through U Sports. I've played against Super Bowl champions. I've played with Super Bowl champions. I've played with Heisman runner-ups. You know, like we, we ended up in the same spot regardless. They played in front of 92,000 fans. They played in the big house down in, in Michigan and stuff, right? And we took such different routes but at the end of the day they're they're my teammates they're my opponents and we ended up in the same spot so for um it it doesn't matter the route you take if you are a good enough player you will end up where you're supposed to be as long as you take care of business on and off the field um and you know as as far as i'm concerned like you we talked about you you can use the the broadcast and the media attention that games like the panda game get to promote our sport nationwide and um you know, there, there's a, other huge rivalry games that deserve the same attention too, like Laurier Waterloo. That's a huge rivalry game ev- every time that happens as I, well, right? I enjoy turning that game on, honestly. Like if we're yeah. uh, if we're not like playing, because obviously, like a lot of times, like things like fixate on, at the exact same time. But I think they had it on like a, I want to say like a Thursday or a Friday night, so I was able to watch it. Like I love turning that game on. Like that one's another big one too. Yep, yeah. Queens, Queens homecoming, Western homecoming. Um, I mean, there's there's some big games that attract a lot of fans and and just don't get the media attention that they deserve. And and the better job we do promoting the Canadian product, the better the better young athletes and young community coaches are going to understand um, the high level of football that we have here in Canada. Mm-hmm. No, exactly. And I guess uh, you know going back to the route and how you take it because I guess the next steps for you was the uh, the combine and I think in terms of maybe the uh, historically rough or like worst case scenario combines I think uh, your story might uh, might reach the top so if, if you want to let the people know a little bit about that yeah man For, fortunately I got one day one day of the combine in where I got to do all the testing the jumps the bench and all that stuff um, and it went extremely well. And then the second day when um, we, you put on pads and you're doing the football drills, um, we were in an in indie period with the other running backs. And uh, just I, I can't even really describe what happened. We were just doing a step over bag drill and I put my foot down on the ground. It was literally that simple. I put my foot down on the ground like I've done 100,000 other times in my career, every single indie period from um, tyke football. And uh, I just kind of felt my foot like roll over and knew instantly that something was wrong. And uh, it swelled up like real quick, real fast. And uh, no one kind of knew what was going on. And then 
and ended up being about four weeks after I got back in Ottawa in a walking boot that I finally got diagnosed um, with a Lis Frank fracture dislocation, which is a hard injury to diagnose, especially given the circumstances. I mean, you normally see it with falls from high-rise buildings or high-velocity car accidents. Like it's it's a hard injury to uh, to get, and it's an uncommon injury. Um, and yeah, it's, it's essentially the, the ligaments that support the bones in the middle of your foot, um, break or fail and your bones are free to move around. So, I mean, even wearing a walking boot for about two weeks, um, while I was getting it diagnosed, I mean, I could literally feel my foot dislocating on certain steps, like into the ground and, um, up until about 2009, um, the repair was surgically putting in pins and uh, needles and screws, which would have essentially ended my career. Um, because obviously, if, if your midfoot doesn't move the way it's supposed to be, you can't run. So, um, I mean, I was fortunate that it, it happened after uh, a surgery was invented called a tightrope fixation, which they basically uh, screw through the middle of your foot put a little tight rope fixation they call it it's basically like a flexible wire that mimics the the ligaments and then a screw on the uh outside and top of your foot and uh it took about a year and a half to fully rehab before i was able to well before i felt like myself again let's put it that way um so i mean yeah that that happened in front of all the coaches all the scouts and and everything and it ended up uh basically costing me the rest of my combine and uh cost me my draft year as well so um it was pretty close to a nightmare situation in career but i i was fortunate enough i mean I I have a great support <laughs> support staff I'm saying I have I have a great support staff I'm calling it cuz I'm talking professionally but it's really my family and friends <laughs> that that keep me motivated and keep me going and um you know I I basically was in rehab mode I I had a goal by that point I mean I got that far to the CFL combine I wasn't about to just give up because of an injury right so um I ended up going back finishing my fifth year at the University of Ottawa playing for coach Barisi um there and then uh it it was a little bit of an interesting uh draft experience obviously too going going back a little bit because we had two players from my team that year that were drafted um and obviously I didn't get drafted I had to go with my agent and call the teams and say hey listen like I need surgery I can't play this year like it's I'm gonna be a project unfortunately like there's nothing I can do it's gonna be a while before I can run again but uh so it was it was a little bit hard going through draft day and and obviously being happy for my teammates but feeling a little sorry for myself and I'd be lying if I said that that didn't happen right given given the circumstances but um, it ended up probably uh, working out, I, w- I don't want to say better, but it worked out in the end because what happened was after the draft, I had about five teams trying to put me on their negotiation list to, to get my rights to sign me um, when I was available. And so I ended up essentially getting to pick where, where I wanted to go. Um, and the Toronto Argonauts were one of those teams um, that were interested and uh, my dad's entire side of the family uh, lived in Toronto. Um, Toronto was the team that I watched most often growing up because my dad was an Argos fan, obviously being from Toronto. Um, so it was a fairly easy choice for me uh, to choose the Argonauts. And then, I mean, uh, the rest is history. I, I played my fifth year at the University of Ottawa, signed with the Toronto Argonauts as a free agent right after the season as soon as they could sign me, and then uh, went to training camp with them in 2014 and ended up making the roster. And now I'm on year seven of the CFL career, so no, it's uh, yeah. it's pretty impressive, and yeah, I mean it. It really does put everything into perspective, too, right? Where it's just like you know, sometimes I guess if you're you know you're going through the motions and you know you're so frustrated, I it, it's one of those I guess where you just kind of try and think of that mindset where it's like like I got to do everything that I can to get out of this, and like almost hey, like it always could be could be worse too, right? And like trying to power through. Yeah, no, exactly. And I'm, mindset's everything, man. Men, mental toughness and mind and your mindset. I mean, the situation is only as bad as your mind let lets it be, right? I mean, so um, to to me, I just approached it as another challenge. Uh, I mean, instead of viewing it as a setback, I'm viewing it as a challenge, and uh, that was kind of my mindset. And I mean, <laughs> I uh, <laughs> sorry, my my dog's just. <laughs> 
saying hello to uh, Rob right now. That's why I'm laughing. But uh, no, yeah, it's 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 all about your mindset. And I mean, I wanted to play professional football, and as far as I was concerned, nothing was going to stop me. Um, so it, it it is what it is, given the circumstances. Um, I I fought through it and and got better and um, made it. Yeah. And so I guess now, you know, now you're a pro, uh, you know, you're with that Argos organization. Uh, now it's, it's what the sport that you loved and it's been a passion and a hobby essentially your whole life. Now, now it's a career. Uh, how'd you handle that adjustment? <laughs> it's, it's different, man. It's, it's different. I mean, in, in university, um, and in, in every other aspect until you get paid to play football, there's there's one motivation, right? There's a singular motivation for everybody on the team. And uh, once money becomes involved, um, people, at the end of the day, the goal is always to, to win the Grey Cup, right? But, um, I mean, you have guys that are close to 40 years old with kids, guys that are 30 years old with kids, guys that are fresh out of NFL training camps, guys that are fresh out of university football like me. It's all over the place. And, I mean, you, you do get all ulterior motives. Some people are playing for their family. Some people are playing for the money. Some people are playing um, for the Grey Cup. You know what I mean? And it's you'd be lying if you said that that didn't happen. And, um I mean, it, it changes things for sure. The locker room dynamic is is a little bit different. Um, and, you know, I again, I, it was one of those situations where I, I was fortunate. I was mentored by some amazing people, not to mention football players. I mean, I walked into a room with uh, guys like Ricky Ray, Chad Owens, Andre Dury, right? Some, some phenomenal players. Um, that'll probably well they will be in the cfl hall of fame <laughs> at one point right and I, and I mean i i was fortunate to walk into that situation and be mentored by those guys young in my career young in my career um so it was it was uh it was fun i mean it's it's it was nerve-wracking my first training camp experience and uh honestly my my first season as well it's one of those things where um you, you get a little bit anxious because the roster changes every single week, right? So it's it's one of those situations where I've I'd never in my football career been in a situation where I'm constantly looking over my shoulder at the next guy behind me wondering if I'm going to be in the lineup this week. And that was the first experience that I've ever had with that. And that's a, a huge mental hurdle that young players have to pass. Um, and you know what? You, you have to, again, become comfortable with being uncomfortable and adapting to the situation, right? So so the quicker that you can adapt, the quicker that you're able to thrive. And and again, again, it's, it's a huge learning curve. You go from a high school play book to a U sports playbook that's a huge difference same thing you're an 18 year old coming in with a certain body type versus a 25 year old that's a certain body type huge phys- physical difference as well now you might not have the the physical differences in transitioning from U sports to uh the CFL but you have a huge mental hurdle I mean the playbook doubles triples quadruples <laughs> compared to the U sports playbook so so there's a steep learning curve all the terminology is different it's it's essentially like I equate it to learning a different language because it is when you're talking about completely different terminology it's it's like learning a different language right so the faster that you can pick that up the faster you can get onto the field and then not only that it, you have to adapt be able to adapt to uh, other situations I'll, I'll tell you one thing it was the first time I've been around um, or played against players that have played in the NFL and NCAA athletes and stuff like that and the very first thing that strikes you is the speed of the game the the Americans bring up the pace and speed of the game like crazy these NCAA athletes are fast man <laughs> these these guys that played in the NFL are fast you go from being one of the the fastest guys in U sports football probably to being average on the CFL so it, it changes the game that way as well right so there's there's a ton of different hurdles that you have to be able to uh, adapt to, and the faster you can you can adapt and adjust your your mindset and skill set to those things, the better off you're going to be, and the faster you're going to see the field. Mm-hmm. No, it's interesting, and it, yeah, it's very adaptive, and it's even for those NS, uh, NFL, NCAA guys too. Like uh, they're 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 also adapting different ball size, different uh, different way the game's played, obviously with the downs and the, the size of the field and things of that nature too, right? So. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting how it all uh, how it all kind of works and uh, just inter- intertwines with each other, right? And even too, which is kind of impressive, you're seeing guys, uh, you know, go CFL, NFL, NFL, CFL, right, and uh, making those adjustments on a on a dime, right? So it very much is that you know adaptability is a, a very positive trait to have 
within pro athletes. Yeah, absolutely. You, it's, like, it's like I said, you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. I mean, you, you can't uh, ever get comfortable in the situation. And um, like you said, the one, the, one, the one advantage that Canadian athletes have against these guys that are coming up from the NCAA or the, the NFL is that we're used to playing Canadian football. We're used to the rules, and you have to use that to your advantage for sure. But like you said, adaptability is a, is a huge skill set. Some people self-sabotage by getting into their own head before they can even show what they do on the field. Um, so, so the mental aspect of the game and preparation is extremely important once you get to the professional level. Mm-hmm. What, was, uh, what was Ricky Ray's favorite play call? <laughs> <laughs> Ricky Ray's favorite play call. Um, oh, man. I, I don't know. You'd have to ask him. He, R- Ricky Ray, he's like as as a mentor. I mean, he's he's as quiet as they come. Let's put that. He's not a raw raw guy, right? Like I've played with guys like if if you've played with guys like Hank Henry Burris, right? He's a raw raw guy. He's an in your face. He's a loud. He's a pregame speech. Ricky Ray is California cool. Like he's <laughs> he's quiet. He's calm. He never gets up. Never gets down. Just he's he's a professional. He's another coach out on the field. You know what I mean? And Henry Burris is the exact same way. He's another other coach out on the field as well but he does it loud <laughs> Ricky Ray does it does it quietly um so you know he was he kind of leads by example and um him staying cool under pressure never getting high never getting low is is definitely something that uh rubbed off on me and I mean he, he even being at the age that he was when I played with him he's just such a student of the game and you pick up on those habits right it's it's the same with Chad Owens and Andre Dury like those two guys were machines man they they'd run a hundred reps in practice and then stay after practice and run extra routes and you're like man like you two are already like two of the best receivers in the league like calm down and it just was never enough for them you know what I mean like they had that work ethic so to see that and them put in that much work I mean that's something that I, I really try to, to model my game after and model my work ethic after as well. And it, it resonates with young players when you have old players on the team that have that kind of work ethic. Yeah, and man, now that I think about it, you've been pretty blessed in the uh, quarterback situation. <laughs> Ricky Ray, Henry Burris, Brad Sinopoli in, in college. Yeah, or, Trevor Harris. Yeah, Trevor Harris is another one. Yeah, like, uh, I mean, <laughs> what's the secret to finding good QBs, I guess? Like, I I don't know. I've been I've been fortunate. I mean, like like I said, even even I mean, I'm naming those three, but I mean, Dom Davis mm-hmm. here now, Nick Arbuckle. I, I've had time to spend around him the this past off season. Obviously, didn't get the chance to play with him yet this year, but looking forward to it next year. Mm-hmm. But I mean. The, you don't make it to the CFL as a quarterback by being a bad player. I'll, I'll put it that way. Like There's some been some very good quarterbacks that have come into training camp and just haven't gotten an opportunity or, or a shot because, the, one, the CFL field is 65 yards wide. Like mm-hmm. If you're throwing uh, an out to the field or a hook to the field to the Z receiver out wide, you have to put it on or it's a pick six you know what I mean like it's a you you might be throwing a 45 yard pass for a five yard gain like it exposes quarterbacks that cannot throw the ball um or don't have the arm strength to do it so I mean uh it's it's I mean it's I've been blessed and lucky to play with amazing quarterbacks here in the CFL but I mean there's also some phenomenal quarterbacks that I haven't had the opportunity to play with here in the CFL that I really enjoy watching because they're exciting players as well it's it's a quarterback friendly league and if if you can play if you've got the arm strength if you can move it's it's a great opportunity for some of these guys that come up from uh, the states yeah no it's just almost the the beauty of the situation sometimes right and like yeah yeah, like I said, like you, there's there's so many uh, talented quarterbacks and like the a lot of the stories and like I mean you're even um, seeing now too um, Winnipeg's guy um, Strebler. Yeah, he's down with uh, Arizona. Arizona right now, yeah. and he's like getting a few reps. Obviously, they got Kyler Murray, right? But yeah. the, short you know. yardage situations yeah. and stuff. Yeah, no, I mean what what he did last year too. It's impressive. Like I said, I've I've always been impressed with guys I play with or guys that I don't. I mean, good football is good football. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And if you're if you're so stubborn that you can't watch somebody on another team or from the sidelines and be like that that dude's a player, like he can play. You know what I mean? I've been on the field 
on special teams playing against people and, and certain things that they've done have, have impressed me. Like you human beings as athletes and what they're able to do is, is incredibly impressive. And I mean, you get a front row seat to it being media on the sidelines and stuff like that. But honestly, I wish, I wish that there was a way that general fans could get really get an appreciation for some of these athletes that are playing the game to see how high they can jump, how fast they can jump, how they move. Like it's, it's incredible. And I mean, like I said, I'd, I'd be lying if I haven't played played against guys that are really good and impressive athletes and like I said good football players are good football players whether they play with me against me or I'm watching them on TV I can appreciate good football yeah no a hundred percent and it's like it, it's so key to, and like it's something that I stress all the time because uh, you know you'll get like the scattered call and like people will ask you like oh like what do you think's gonna happen and like oh like what's going on with him like it, he's it's not working out like what what's going on right but it's like if you like take a step back and look at big picture and look at like every like little intricate detail that uh these uh like players are are working on and things of that nature like it's crazy right like it's stuff that you won't even be able to fathom honestly because it's like um i i i find the best example that i like to use is like um lp richie and lou um those guys like you know uh, LP's the, the long snapper, Richie's the holder, and Lou's the kicker. And it's like a lot of people are just like, okay, yeah, it's snap to snap to hold to, to kick, and it's a field goal, simple as that. And it's like what people don't realize is in practice, like they're practicing, like LP is practicing his snaps to the point where it's like, okay, we're going to strategically snap this ball and get it down to a repetition where the, la- uh, the laces are essentially being in the perfect position that we want as soon as it comes into Richie's hands. And, like, those, like, intricate t- details are what, pe- like, they're working on in practice. And, like, there's no way that, uh, you know, from, like, the outside looking in that you look at a field goal and you're like, oh, yeah, like, uh, you know, they're they're working on, like, that small of a specific detail that makes a big difference, right? Yeah. First of all, I want to point out that you called Richie Leone a holder, so you definitely have well, to tag yeah, him yeah. in that and not a punter because he's <laughs> going to love that, and I love that you said that. So that's <laughs> awesome because Richie and I joke about that all the time. So I love that. And then second of all, like you're talking about, for sure, pe- people don't understand that how the minute details matter. Like you're talking about in terms of, uh, being able to long snap so that Richie gets the laces in the proper position. One, people can, I guarantee you cannot appreciate how hard that is. And then two, we're talking about as well, like not only that, but the velocity at which he snaps the ball with. Like we're talking about like one one hundredth of a second in terms of how fast LP gets the ball back there mm-hmm. could be the difference between a blocked field goal or not. Like it's, it's absolutely incredible that the details matter and people that take care of the details are the people that do well. Mm-hmm. No, 100%. And, uh, yeah, and then even on, like, Lou's part, too, like, there's always, like, little intricates. And, yeah, no, uh, Richie knows I love him. (laughs) Richie is a, uh, you know, Richie's a great punter, a fantastic punter, honestly. Like, and one of those two where we can even look at him and the intricate things and the little details that that he does that that makes a big difference, right? But uh, obviously, Richie, I'm only calling you a holder because (laughs) it's the the situation that we – uh, put out there, right? Like the the scenario right yeah. now. But uh, he he loves it though. He takes that. I've never seen somebody take so much pride in that uh, position and that role. Like I've seen like a lot of guys uh, uh, hold like whether at the university level or mm-hmm. you know even seeing how some guys do it CFL NFL. I don't think there's a, a more prideful holder than than Richie in the league. No, for sure. And I mean that's that's why they're professionals. That's mm-hmm. why they're professionals. The the little details matter, and they can be uh, especially that field goal ops, right? I mean, it could literally be the difference between winning the game or losing the game. And you never want to say that the game comes down to one play because there were 60, well, 120 other plays, right, in the game. But at the end of the day, it could be up to the kicker <laughs> to make to make one kick, yeah. right? So, uh, I mean, it's, it's yeah, it's extremely important and the little details matter. And that's, that's just it. That's what's so great about the game of football is that every single position on every single play has to perfect those little details in order for the play to work right yeah no and i mean like i like i use that example because that's kind of like the easiest one for me to articulate yep. but like i've sat down with uh you know rj harris um he had me out to do um his daughter's like birthday party and, yeah like, we, we were just chatting at like dinner and um i believe it was uh rhymes was there as well and they Dom, like, yep. yeah and they were uh 
chatting back and forth and like they were telling me about like a few like intricate details on like the receiver position and it's like holy smokes like yeah like just you know from the motions of like knowing like you know when you're running your route and then like also kind of like keeping eyes on like the quarterback and like seeing like where they are in the situation and you know things that you even mentioned earlier where it's like um okay yeah i'm in the check down with brad one two okay he's obviously not going to me let's go find a linebacker Mm -hmm. because he's probably going to take off right like those little things that like a lot of people aren't just going to be able to to notice right 100% 100% on uh, on any given like you're talking about just a, a pass play when you talk about linemen I mean certain steps if if their set is too shallow too deep can affect the play right timing timing of the snap who they're calling the center's calling the pass protection as well the running back same thing your check release for for receivers um, I mean we're talking west coast football because most most of the systems up here are are west coast spot throws right and uh, our West Coast offensive systems. And, I mean, if if a receiver breaks the route at 11 instead of 12, they're at the spot too early. Quarterback can't hit them. If they break it at 13 instead of 12, they're not at the spot in time. If if they round it as opposed to breaking it down, they're at the spot too early. Like, it, there's so many little nuances, and that's, that's what's amazing about the game of football is that people don't understand. They see the overall product. They see the overall play. They don't understand how the individual athletes work together and how every single little detail about what you do every play affects the outcome of the play Mm -hmm. you know what i mean and that's why it's so easy to put the blame on quarterbacks or um somebody who missed a block or somebody who dropped a pass but there's so many different factors that go into into one play that when you start breaking down 60 offensive plays and you realize it that way it's like that's why we spend four hours of film (laughs) a day because it takes that long and and you need that that analysis in order to perfect your craft and the people that are willing to put in that effort to go the extra mile are the people that succeed mm-hmm. no 100 percent. and yeah we could go into a rabbit hole of yeah all this. <laughs> yeah um but yeah i mean hey when uh, when it became an option that uh, you know the red blacks could be your future home like how easy was that? You know, come back to, <laughs> come back to the hometown. It was, uh, it, you know, I I want to say it was easy, but um, I I had a good time in Toronto, and um, I am a pretty loyal person, and I really respected Toronto for giving me the opportunity to to get into the CFL, and that's something that's special to me. You know, I. I very very thankful to uh jim barker who is the general manager coach milanovich who's now with uh edmonton after being with jacksonville as the quarterback coach and offensive coordinator um but i i'm very appreciative to them and the situation that they put me in for those two years and giving me my first chance but to be in the local community year round and play football um, here in Ottawa that I played university, high school, uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's something special. And I guarantee you, if you ask anybody around the league, if you get a chance to play for professional sports in your hometown, it is incredibly special. I mean, the Red Blacks have a tradition of letting fans on the game, on the field after the game. And that's something that, I mean, I'm always out there because at any given game, it's like someone comes up to me and they're like, remember me? And it's like, it's been 13 years. And I'm like, yeah, they're like, of course, what's up? And, uh, so I mean, the people that I run into being able to help out the football community year round as well being able to do um, appearances in in the community being able to do some charity work um, as well it's it's something that's special to me to be able to to play in front of this community for sure Mm -hmm. no and that's uh you know you mentioned and I want to touch on that because I think in terms of like one of the things that like the Red Blacks organization does like that that fans on the field is so special and such a unique experience that like I mean I've been to like on the road in like university games and it's Thanksgiving weekend all the families and friends are there because it's it's a long weekend and then um, players have to run up to the to the bleachers because they're not allowed down on the field right so it's like it's such a unique experience and like I recommend anybody who's in Ottawa if uh, you know the Red Blacks are playing to, to check it out and not just like you know okay three minutes left let's get in the car because uh, you know we want to get out of here before the rush of the parking and all, all that right but like just waiting and you know getting to walk down and, and walk around and feel what it's like because it is special and like I said like there's always there's never not at least 10 to 15 guys that are just out there like waiting right and like you really do get the opportunity to just go up and be like hey like what's up like 
and like what's special too is like you know girlfriends wives families are there and stuff like that and like for me it's a little bit different because it's almost nice because i get to i get to talk to your to the wives and the uh the families and the mom and dads and it's just like you get to know them as well as as you guys right so it's like oh like how you been like and, and it's a nice time to catch up but even for you know the fans to really get that one-on-one uh i guess not one-on-one but time with the players after especially you know after a, a big matchup or things like that it, it's so unique yeah no absolutely and i think that's what sets the the cfl um apart from some of the other professional organizations is the access to the players right i mean um the access that that the cfl gives gets to the players and and the fans and i mean um the number of people that I've met through through the CFL and and the fan base here in Ottawa and stuff like that it's it's absolutely uh, incredible. I mean, other other sports leagues, it's almost impossible for fans to to interact and um, on social media and it, let alone in person, right? And I mean, the CFL, like I said, like we said, um, I'll, at any given game, I'll meet like thousand people after the game signing autographs just saying hi um i mean at the end of the day we're we're people no one's making a million dollars a season well some quarterbacks are getting close actually but but um the vast majority of us uh uh are making million dollars right and and that's something that's special about the cfl is is the amount of access the the fans and uh outsiders get to to the players and that's honestly one of the one of in my mind the things that I enjoy the most. I love meeting people. Um, it's great for networking opportunities, like we talked about it in terms of career advancement as well. And uh, it, it allows you to feel a part of the community um, as well, right? It, it when you have those types of interactions with the fans, um, especially in my hometown. I mean, it it makes you feel a part of the community and. Um, you learn to you learn to say hi to the same people all the time. You figure out who the super fans are quite easily because they're always around, right? And uh, I mean, it's it's special. You get to build relationships with people in the community that I don't think other professional athletes get to do. Mm-hmm. No, I gotta say, I, I I love the super fan, like because the super fans. The, the funny thing is, is like they're they almost like they, they love everything. Like they, I, I mean. Uh, they they almost become like fans of myself too right and like the support that like you like i even like me just like you know taking photos and things like that like those super fans like and they make it so much fun to like you know come to the thing because then like they know your name and like they're almost as excited like i mean they're probably not if they see you they're probably more excited than they uh than <laughs> when they're seeing me but they they make it feel like i'm like oh yeah like i'm i'm basically the starting quarterback today what's up guys how you been right like they're it's awesome. It, it makes coming to like arenas and and fields like so much fun, right? Like it, it's so unique and like you said, you really get to know who they are uh, yeah. pretty quick, right? Especially with like interactions like that, right? So yeah, you no, know, it's uh, it's special. And I guess you know another special moment, you know that great cup. Let's uh, like kind of dive into that week. Uh, you know, you, you find out you're going there, the motions, the, the media, things of that nature, and then you know ultimately getting in that game. I mean, yeah, it was that entire year is kind of kind of a blur. I say that, but uh, I mean, it's four years ago now, um, and uh, I missed the the first few games of the season um, with a knee injury and stuff like that. But uh, like you said, that was that was my first year here in Ottawa um, after winning that uh, Eastern final. I mean. It's it's something special. I had never been a part of that before. Um, the entire week in Toronto is is fun. Grey Cup week is is awesome. I mean, you get guys flying in from all over Canada, um, fans of all of their teams, um, coming and staying in different hotels and stuff. Obviously, with it being in Toronto, it was special as well, having played there before and having family there. Um, but the media opportunities are fun. All of the the engagements with the the players, the fans, um, media days. It's a lot of fun. Um, practices are more fun. <laughs> like it's it's a very very cool week to be a part of, and it, it's something special. And then um, obviously going into the game, uh, some drama early on with with Hank and his knee prior to the game, and. Um, I mean, we really didn't know what's going on, but getting into the game, we got out to a big start and then Calgary caught up <laughs> in the, in the second half. And, uh, you know, it was, it was honestly one of the most exciting games that I've probably been a part of. Um, it was fun, uh, holding our breath on their last, uh, drive there in overtime. And 
it was, I mean, as soon as we saw the ball hit the ground on that third down, I mean, it was like pfft, an instantaneous joy. Like it's, it's the culmination of um, the season when you work that hard for that long with, with a certain group of people on a daily basis. Um, it's something to celebrate and we had every right to be as happy as we are. And uh, it's, it's something that I'll honestly remember forever. Um, the, the celebration in the locker room after was probably something that I'll always remember as well. Um, that's special. It is as crazy as you see on TV when you see people celebrating after winning. Um, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, I, I've got a Grey Cup ring um, with my name on it. My Grey Cup or my name is on the Grey Cup. And I mean, that's that's something that'll be there forever. And I mean, it's it's history. And to be a part of that with with that particular team and uh, the other 45 names that are that are on the Grey Cup with me that year. I mean, it's it's something special and uh, it's something that I'll remember forever. And like I said, to be a part of history and to, to end um, the season with with the highest performance bonus we, you can at that level, at the top level of your career is is I mean, it's phenomenal. It's it's a life's work that came to a culmination with with your name essentially etched in history on the Great Cup. And uh, that's something that I'm proud of. And it's something that I hope my grandchildren will be proud of. And that's the way that I look at it. So it's special. Mm -hmm. No, 100 percent. Who knows? Maybe. Uh, hey, like you're seeing it more and more often. Next gen family members winning and, you know, making the NHL, making the uh, NFL, CFL. Right. So who knows? Maybe the grandkids are <laughs> bringing you back the great. Couple yeah, <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully. Exactly. No, I mean, yeah, it definitely it's a crazy moment. It's, that was actually my first year in Ottawa. Uh, so I, I was watching that game in um, uh, the common room of, uh, of Res with all, uh, all my buddies and things like that and, like, the, the dramatics of it all and the fact that, you know, the, the overtime. And it's, it's interesting, too, because it's, like, you know, for such a, a time sport where, like, you're almost waiting for the clock to run out and then you can celebrate. It's different in football when you get that walk-off celebration because it, it really happens unless it goes into overtime, right? So it, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was fun. Like I said, as soon as that ball hit the ground on on their third down, and we knew we won, it was just crazy. Helmets flying in the air everywhere, people jumping around. Like I said, it, you know what that that team was so special, and uh, the coaching staff, the the veterans on the team, the leadership group, the captains. I mean, they they deserved it. You know what I mean? I want to say that I deserved it for the for the. Um, amount of effort that I put into that year but every single person on that team deserved the Grey Cup that year we deserved the Grey Cup that year and it's something that's special and like I said it's it's not just my name on the Grey Cup it's everybody else that was on the active roster that game and and you know what the practice squad guys are just as important um as well and it, they deserved it they, they really did. So um, I'm happy for them. I'm happy for us. And I'm happy that us as a team in 2016 will be able to remember that specific group of guys and what we achieved. Yeah, and I mean, because the thing is, too, is like, honestly, like, I'm surprised now knowing what I know, because obviously when I came to Ottawa, because first time, like, I was ever in Ottawa was when I moved to Ottawa. Like, I'd never been in the city, didn't do a campus tour. It was just like, okay, they're taking me, let's go, right? So... Uh, when I when I got back, like pro football was already back in Ottawa, right? So the fact that you know, like knowing the history and like uh, of Ottawa football and like kind of how deprived like this fan base was for a long time uh, without a pro team and like you know finally getting back and after I think it was that that was year two of the return, right, of the Red Blacks. Uh, year three. Year three. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because they went to – they lost the Grey Cup in 2015. Yeah, and then – Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so year three of, uh, of being back, and it's like, you know, you, you reach that pinnacle again, and it's such a – it's a reward almost for the whole uh, community, right? And it's something to celebrate, which is pretty special, right? So the, the parade and everything like that, too, I, I assume – uh, probably brings back some more fond memories. Yeah, the parade was crazy. The support that we received here here in Ottawa once we got back was, um, I mean, it, it was insane. The the parade that that ended at uh, Lansdowne in the Aberdeen Pavilion, um, 
it was absolutely insane. Like you could not see the ground for as far as you looked. Like it was just packed with people. Um, and I mean, it was, like I said, the support that we got and still have here in Ottawa for professional football is, is incredible. And, um, I mean, I've, I've said that to people my entire life. It's when, when people were saying that Ottawa is not a football town because the CFL teams kept not working. It was, it was never, a supported problem people in ottawa love football i mean and CAFA was one of the largest amateur football associations in all of canada when i was growing up um we have always had high level football here in ottawa um it's just never been the right situation or right ownership group or run properly and things like that which is is unfortunate in the past but i mean obviously no looking back now with with the ownership group and the management and front office and the support that we get right now it's it's absolutely incredible it's um it's phenomenal place to play i mean we pretty much sell out almost every single game which is special and the support we get in the community is is almost unrivaled here in canada as well so i mean it's it's a phenomenal place to play and uh, it's it's a great city it's a big city with a small town feel as i'm sure you can appreciate coming from yeah. the east coast and no 100 percent. i like i tell people that all the time because like a lot of people are like oh yeah like what's it like and i'm like honestly like yeah, it's a big city, but it's a small town. Like, I yeah. think, um, I, I do, like, I love Toronto, and I, um, like I said, like, I was looking at Toronto, and, like, obviously I'm studying, like, at a university that's in Toronto, but, of course, everything's online yeah. now, so, but, and I'm never opposed to, you know, the possibility of where life takes me, and if it is, like, Toronto, that's, like, such a big city, but, like, when, I, I've never lived there, but through staying there for, like, a few weeks and, and being in that city, it's, like, you you notice that you're in a big city. Like, it, it's a little bit more, um, I'll say daunting, even though that might not be the best word to describe it, but it, it, you you pick up on it. You you know a little bit uh, a little bit more, but, like, Ottawa, it's like, I'm in a big city, but sometimes, like, I, I don't even realize it, right? Like, it's, like, um, just kind of, like, going through the channels and things like that. Like, it's a little bit um, of a uh, nicer pace where you can kind of, catch your breath and smell the roses in a, in a sense. No, absolutely, like, exactly. And th- yeah. th- that's why I always describe it as, as a big city that feels like a small city. I mean, because like you said, it's 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 the nation's capital, right? Yeah. But I mean, it, at the end of the day, the, the traffic's not nearly as crazy as Toronto and Montreal. We have a fraction of the population as Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver. Like, mm. it's, uh, it's honestly a great place to live and a great place to play. Yeah, no, I, I really couldn't agree more. And I think, too, like, because even, you know, like you were saying, like, Ottawa, you know, people were saying they don't get, they're not a football town, right? And, like, even, like, in my realm of things and, like, digital creation, like, a lot of people are like, oh, like, Ottawa's, like, Ottawa's not that. But, I mean, honestly, like, it, it is. Like, there's lots of opportunities for it. Like, I mean, I think I've, it, looking back on it, it's like if I was in Toronto, like, I'd be almost, you know, battling uphill constantly, right? But, you know, when you look at like the opportunities that are here in Ottawa and it's almost like, Hey, this is almost like a, it's the best not kept secret almost. Where it's <laughs> like, they, there's lots of ways to get in and, and do those things. Right. So like for, for people to say it, it's just like, honestly, like, no, like it's like, you can get here and like, you can do these things and like really grow something special. Right. And like the, you know, talking about like the social media influencers and, and things of that nature. Like, I mean, um, you know, I've got, did you ever play with Dustin Wilson? Yep. Yeah. So like, you know, he's doing great things mm-hmm. online. Killing now, it right? on YouTube. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And like, that's a guy who, uh, you know, has got over 4 million now of a online audience. And like, you know, you look at that and he, like, he's been in Ottawa is <laughs> like the whole from like start to finish. Right. And he's built that, that here. Right. And even that, that group that they're like, uh, in like his friend group and stuff like that. Like those are all like. Ottawa guys who have like massive like online followings and things like mm-hmm. that so it's even like things of that nature football like it, it really is a special uh special city with like a lot because you know we're talking about football like we're talking about two aspects but 67s are great like you know that that's a great product um I mean you got the Sens out in Canada like there's there's lots to do the the Byward Market is, is unique TD place in itself like that lands down area mm-hmm. one of my favorite spots in the city right so yeah no it's it's cool it's uh I it's funny because when I made my decision, it's like I had no idea what I was getting into, right? I could have went into basically the worst possible decision that I've ever made, right? Like it was very much a blind one, but 
looking back on it, it's like, no, like this is actually probably the best decision that I could have made, right? So it, it, it's interesting. And I guess, you know, with all this being said, I guess we can kind of lead it into, you know, life after athletics and, and things of that nature because, I mean, you know, you're um, – you're in your career now, but you're still, uh, you know, making a lot of uh, investments in terms of the other things that you're doing, whether it be, you know, the nutrition side of things, the brand work, the um, athletics, uh, personal training and, and things of that nature. So if you wanted to dive in a little bit more into that and like why it's important. Yeah, I mean, right. I mean, I, I, uh, I've worked as a personal trainer and got my first personal training certification in 2011. Um, I wrote and passed the certified strength and conditioning specialist through the NSCA um, in 2014, obviously graduated with a degree in human kinetics. Um, so that's basically been my part-time off-season job uh, for the past, well, since 2011, right? The past nine years now. Um but uh, it's it's what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about human human performance and um, basically getting people to see what their bodies are capable of, um, and whether that's through uh, mental skills and helping them with with day to day habits or behaviors, or through things that are simple like strength training. Regardless of their goals, um, that's what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about human sciences, um, and also obviously uh, the coaching aspect of it as well. I I love coaching. I love um, the science behind coaching. I would love an opportunity to uh, coach football, whether it be at the U sports level or eventually professionally i i want to stay involved in sports and sports organizations um i i'm very passionate about that but uh in the meantime you know personal training and and being a strength coach and uh helping people coaching people along the process of getting them to their physical and mental goals is something that i'm i'm also very passionate about and uh you know i i find it rewarding and i think that's why i'm so drawn to it is when people realize what they are capable of doing and the light bulb goes off it's extremely rewarding to be able to sit back and watch that and and feel happy for people um if you know what i'm trying to say so it's it's something that i find very rewarding and uh like i said the the science behind it is something that is, has always interested me and uh just developing as as a human as a person and as a coach mm -hmm. yeah no and i guess um you know maybe for uh, some advice i guess you know um in terms of people who you know are maybe uh, not in their ideal situation, whether it be physically or mentally, but like, what would you recommend in terms of you know the first steps to kind of getting that uh, that boat uh, or just start it right that process? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a huge fan of of habit building. Um, I, it's extremely important, you know, um, it, building positive habits and and getting into a routine. Um, so the problem that so many people have is they quit before behaviors become automatic. And when that happens, uh, it, it's disheartening because it doesn't take that long. What people don't realize is that it really only takes two to three months for behaviors or habits to become part of a routine or to become part of uh, uh, automatic, right? So when people ask like, hey, how do you wake up at 6 a.m. and run out on the field when it's raining and cold? Like, how do you how do you get yourself up to do that? And it's like, it's not a problem. I've been doing it for two years now it's it's me it's my life it's it becomes part of your life it becomes part of automatic and people don't understand that when it becomes part of your routine or um part of your lifestyle part of your life it becomes easy to prioritize and becomes easy to do it doesn't feel like a job anymore and it gets easier as you go people people quit when it's hard because it's hard to build that consistency in their daily routine once it becomes part of your routine it's easy to prioritize easy to get done you enjoy doing it and it doesn't feel like a chore anymore and uh, just getting people to stick to stick with their goals until it becomes part of their life is is just really my um, is my best piece of advice is what I'd say and building building healthy habits that are going to contribute positively to what you're trying to accomplish whether it's it's body transformation goals or um, anything to do to do with work to do with where you're trying to get to do with your lifestyle um, just building positive habits that are going to steer you in the right direction to where you want to go is the most important thing and I mean I, I come from a structured 
upbringing obviously my my dad served 20 years in the navy so i come from a little bit of a regimented uh military background um so it's easy for me to say those things but i mean the best thing that i can do is is encourage others to essentially adapt um it doesn't have to be regimented or anything close to to military style but there's a lot of amazing people out there that just give up just a little too soon that if they had the proper encouragement and proper direction I guarantee you they'd be able to build these habits into their lifestyle and be able to contribute positively to the, towards their goals. So um, that's probably my best piece of advice is just to stick with it. And even though you might not feel like it is important on the day to do that activity, it's not about today. It's about tomorrow. It's about next week. It's about next month because it's not as simple as just saying, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow is easy to say today and it's easy to say tomorrow and it's easy to say the next day. It's more important than today. It's about your lifestyle and where you want to be tomorrow. Mm-hmm. No, I think that's that's huge, right? And I, there's like a, a quote or a saying that's essentially going around on the internet and stuff like that. It's like, what if you what if you gave up on your dream today and you know tomorrow was actually when you achieved it, right? So yeah. it's like, uh, it, no, it's interesting. It's a great... Uh, Honestly, it's a great piece of advice, and so this is actually everything that I got for you. Um, I mean, this is actually the part of the show now where I just, you know, I hand the podcast over to you. So it's it's your show. You can talk about whatever you want. It could be, you know, a life lesson, childhood story. I mean, hey, I don't know. Maybe you read a good joke or a good book or <laughs> anything of that nature. I know uh, we were chatting a little bit before, and you were saying that, uh, you know, you, you try and mess around with the guitar and the singing a, a little bit. So who knows, maybe you uh, organize a, a backyard concert or, or something like that. But uh, no, I mean, like I said, the, the show's 100% yours now. Perfect. This is the part that I've been waiting for. Everybody, welcome to Brendan's Reels. <laughs> um, I think you've got a better mic voice than I do, man. Uh, on, honestly, uh, I, I love doing this stuff. If, if you let me talk, we'll be here for another hour. <laughs> Um, it is tempting to go grab the guitar and do like a top five songs <laughs> never to play at a party if you have a guitar or something like that. Uh, I do my best rendition of Wonderwall or something like that. Sorry, Oasis. Um, but uh, yeah, no, on, honestly, uh, it, was, it was fun. We covered a whole bunch of topics. Um, you should definitely tag Ottawa Tourism in, <laughs> in a couple of those. Um, Richie got a shout out. Uh, Dustin Wilson got a shout out. Wolfie Raps, another Ottawa kid. <laughs> yeah. I played with his brother. The Rainers hey. are good friends. Yeah, the Rainers are good friends. Yeah, I've met, uh, I met, uh, like Chris Rainer, uh, yep. their dad. Just obviously, he's the well, like go to surgeon, I guess, for uh, around here. And he's um, also like you, one of you Ottawa's doctors. So, dude, he yeah. operated on my foot. He did, yeah, he right? did my Liz Frank surgery. Okay. So, shout out to Dr. Rayner. <laughs> Every, yeah. yeah, the whole Ottawa community is coming in on this. Exactly, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what happens. I've, mm-hmm. I've lived in Ottawa since I was uh, nine, I want to say. Something like that. I don't know. Um, seven, eight, nine. I don't even know. It's been mm-hmm. a long time now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've basically lived all across Canada. I was actually born on the uh, on the West Coast, which, like, nobody ever knows because I yeah. list Orleans as my yeah, hometown. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so everyone assumes that I, I was born here in Ottawa, but I wasn't. I lived in Victoria. I was born in Victoria, B.C., moved to Ottawa, then to Halifax, and then back to Ottawa. So I'm East Coast as well. Yeah, yeah got the East Coast lifestyle hat to prove it. Another shout out. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, no... Honestly, uh, Ottawa, Ottawa is such an amazing place. Um, it's been an amazing journey here. Uh, the high school career, obviously, the university career, uh, professional career. I, I look back and, I mean, people say, like, would, would you do anything differently? And like I said, I've, I've had ups and downs, trials and tribulations, but I honestly wouldn't change a single thing that I did in, in any part of my career because of the people that I met, the, the experiences that I've had and, uh, where it's gotten me. And, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate in that sense that I've met some amazing people along the way. I've gotten the opportunity to play with some amazing people and, uh, I love every single minute of it. Mm -hmm. No, it's awesome. And yeah, I guess that's a a great point to, uh, you know, leave it off on Brendan. Thanks so much for, uh, you know, sitting down and chatting with us today yeah no problem man <laughs> and uh yeah for everyone uh you know listen hey thanks for uh tuning in all the way to the end if you enjoy this podcast you know leave us a review send it to a friend and yeah we're um actually you know if you're coming from youtube because you watch the video component we're gonna try and uh 
you know, set off a, a speed uh, speed <laughs> meter through uh, through the speed or whatnot. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're coming from that and you checked out the podcast, hey, thanks for watching both. And if you're just listening to the podcast, that's something else you can check out. Uh, but, yeah, hey, in the meantime, stay best kind. All right, that's all for this week. This was a really fun chat, and I hope you had as great of a time as I did. See you next week. In the meantime, stay best kind.